Welcome in, everybody. Season has started. Coast to Coast continues to roll along. New episode brought to you by Johnny T-Shirt and johnnytshirt.com. All right, welcome in. Appreciate you guys being here. A new episode of Inside Carolina's Coast to Coast podcast coming at you hard, fast, and in a hurry. And man, we've actually got real basketball to talk about now. Season started. There's actually real games that have taken place. We've got analysis of of actual players and playing styles and minutes and and you name it. And I'm excited to do it. Appreciate everybody being here. Hey, give me a good Macho Man Randy Savage elbow drop on that subscribe button if you have not yet. Uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel, to this podcast, however you consume this show. We want you to be a part of it regularly. We want to make sure that you're automatically getting it to your feed. So subscribe, rate, and review. We appreciate rate and reviews and all feedback. It's good stuff. Trust me, we take it to heart and we try to try to clean up on it. Uh, unless you're a goober and you give us some stupid review, then yeah, we treat you the way you should be treated. But all that aside, I'm just Joey Powell, your host. Happy to be here once again. Uh, with me, as always, the two guys that bring the information that you're here to hear. Sean Moran, Cheryl McMillan. Sean, how's the West Coast? 70 degrees. Can't complain. I just want to point out that if you want to throw weather in our face, I will say I'll be eating Thanksgiving dinner three hours before you. So get <laughs> some, sir. Cheryl, how you living, man? I'm good. My spirit's still trying to recover from Saturday. That uh, didn't but happen. I'm, but I'm good. See, don't bring us down. We're try- We're trying to start with positivity and and high expectations and good feeling and positive vibes only, Shrill. Rail don't rail don't kill my vibe. I wasn't even talking about that. See, I was talking about something else from Saturday. Oh, you're talking about something sipped. different. Saturday, we're like you went you went to Home Depot and they were out of like two and a half inch wood screws. Exactly. Yeah, that's I yeah, hate that. That's, that's what frustrating. It was. That's the only thing that happened on Saturday. That is a legit vibe killer. I'm with you. Guys, we've got a big show lined up. So without further ado, let's get rolling. Um in recognition of the season. Tonight's show, we're going to do players that I'm thankful for. No, we're absolutely not going to do that because that is uh, that is low-hanging fruit and no prep radio. For any of you guys who listen to talk radio out there, if you ever hear your host doing that, it's it's basically, a, hey, it's the holidays and I'm mailing this show in. <laughs> we are not going to do that because you, you expect more of us out there. So what I figured we would do is run down. There's a quick highlight in the recruiting uh, world for North Carolina basketball. In this sense, all we got to say is, Sim Wilcher and Zayden High both signed. Sherell, they had different uh, ceremonies at their schools. Everything went as planned. Next steps for those guys are what exactly? Uh, so their seasons get underway. Well, High season's already underway. Wilcher's gets underway, I think, next week. Um, both have some ESPN Plus slash national television games, so we'll make sure that we post that um, when those games are upcoming. But uh, it's playing their seasons. It's trying to win for a high. It's trying to win a national title. Um, for uh, Wiltshire is trying to win a state title. And then for both of them is seeing if they can make the McDonald's All-American game. I think Wiltshire uh, has a good shot. I think High has a, a good amount of work to do. It, it would be pretty surprising, but you never know what can happen during a year, especially on a, a loaded team and a high-profile team like he has. So those are the next step for those guys. Um, you can check out the releases that Hubert Davis sent out on both, talking about what he liked and and why they recruited them. Um, I think those went out uh, the day that both of them signed. And obviously, if anything you know transpires during the season regarding those guys, we'll bring it to you. Recruiting is going to be quiet for a little while just because you know, this classic season started for um, high school players and you know, UNC's kind of got their own season they're worried about. And I'm sure Sean will be watching these guys as much as he can uh, as things come about. And when he has new things he's picked up on their games, obviously we'll bring it to you here. So, guys, moving away from the recruiting side of things, let's talk about an actual season. The 2022 season and this iteration of the North Carolina Tar Heel basketball team has started in earnest. Uh, they are 4-0. and uh, They are number one in the country, have remained number one for the first uh, five weeks of the season. And then things are going to kind of change. I think if we want to talk about those first four games, uh, I think fans probably are not happy with things, but... Sean, I'll come to you first. What did you see out of those first four games that you liked from the Tar Heels? Good, uh, good, good question. I mean, it, it's uh, it's been a few now, two weeks since we've been able to watch this new new version play after talking about them all summer. Um, <laughs> in terms of things that I liked, um, you know, 
it's a, it's a good question. I'd, I'd say there's more that I've, I've, I've disliked, but we'll try not to be too uh, pessimistic right off the bat. Um, you know, coming, coming from the bench, it was good to see Puff uh, get some playing time uh, against James Madison. So that was, that was nice, especially, you know, before we were talking about transfers, you know, was, was he going to start or, or styles? Um, so I think working him into the mix, that's going to be huge just from a, a depth perspective and something a little different than Pete Nance. Um, Pete Nance is, is definitely not Brady Manic. I think we tried to talk about that all summer, but after the first game, uh, it does look he's getting a little more comfortable, but it's still going to take take some time. Uh, but you can, even last game, you could see they're trying to do a few things differently to get him open, just given he doesn't have that, you know, rapid fire release that, that Manic did. Um, you know, the other thing, Caleb loves attacking the basket. I'm sure we can get into that that more. So, there's a lot of, I'd say, individual things that have liked defensively. The effort has been been pretty good. Um, and, you know, they've definitely shown some growth on that side. But uh, a lot of question marks uh, that still remain. And I think going into this Thanksgiving weekend, we'll start to either get answered or uh, brought to light in terms of some of the competition. Yeah, there's plenty of time to talk about, you know, things that, that are cause for concern and we'll get to it as we, as we move along with the show, but Shrell, same question. Give me a couple of things you liked after seeing this team in the first uh, four games of the Smith center. Uh, I, I like Seth Trimble's defense uh, that has jumped off the screen, especially when he's paired with uh, Licky black and, and Pete Nance. Uh, so that's been tremendous. Um, Pete Nance's defense has been quite the surprise for me personally. Uh, I knew that he was skilled offensively. He was a good passer. Um, that he would fit in and that he'd be able to kind of mesh with the team. But I did not expect him right now. I think he's almost at two blocks a game. Uh, didn't expect that. Uh, didn't expect the way he can kind of move uh, you know, across screens and, and move on the court. So he, he's a little, his lateral quickness to me is a little deceiving. It's a little better than it looks like, you know, just watching from afar. So that's been good. Um, and then there's been a couple of good halves, a couple of good 10 minutes. There hasn't been a complete game, I would say, yet. So just knowing that they're capable is a, a bit different than it was last year when you were still trying to figure out exactly how they would look. Um, and then Armando Baycott, when they give him the ball, when, when he gets the ball on the post, is clearly one of the best players in the country. I think he's proven that between uh, this past Sunday's game and then the second half against uh, College Charleston. So... Uh, I think we know the strength of the team is still, you know, pounding the ball into Armando Baycott and everything else pivots off of that. So those are the things that I think have been impressive slash good thus far. So you and Sean both mentioned something that I want to start with tonight. Um, I feel like this team has shown a defensive identity early in the season. And I think there's individual identities of the players. But I think this team has actually shown flashes that it can be a really good lockdown defensive unit regardless of who's on the floor and I think that may sh- portend well as the offense tries to figure things out. Sherelle, looking back at last year when it felt like North Carolina couldn't stop anybody at times early in the season do you think this is something where we've seen it in instances early in the season you think this is something they can maintain and if so how do they do that? Yeah I definitely do I think part of it is um, their size I mean it's we talked about this all off season this is a big team um, they're formidable when you know I talk about you get off the bus and the all bus team, they look like they can uh they can do things just walking off the bus. I mean six ten, six ten, six eight and a half, uh Caleb Love is six four and a half, and then RJ Davis is six foot. But then you can bring Seth Trimble in along with Prof Johnson and you have another six eight guy, another six three guy. Um, uh, so a lot of a lot of length, um, which is really difficult as everybody knows for shooters. Like the longer somebody's arms are when they're closing out, it makes it harder to see the rim harder to shoot. Um, and then if you do decide to drive, you've got 6'10 Armando Baycott standing there. And I think the biggest difference this year is that when Armando Baycott goes to the bench, you have Pete Nance there who can block shots um, and who has the length to kind of scare guys off from trying to drive all the way to the lane. That was a big thing for a lot of the season last year was guys just getting to the lane and getting to the basket really easy. And I think this year, Having uh, Nance along with Baycott and then having Nance to back up Baycott uh, when that second unit kind of plays together, it's much more difficult to score on UNC. And I was just looking at the numbers and obviously four games, but their defensive two-point percentage is the lowest it's been since 2012. 
um, through four games. And that was the team that had John Henson and Tyler Zeller uh, in the middle. So kind of similar, obviously not, you know, the same guys, but just showing that it's hard to drive in when you've got two huge guys on the court at the same time. Sean, I want to ask you a, a similar question. This team's makeup is different than last year. We've talked about it ad nauseum over the summer. How much does having an actual rim protector like a Pete Nance who can play the four or play the five, assuming UNC is going to work Jalen Washington in at some point, uh, but then you have really good perimeter defenders like Leaky Black, like Seth Trimble that Cheryl mentioned earlier, and I love his defense, uh, and, and Caleb Love and R.J. Davis who have shown that they can be quite tenacious as well. How has just the minor tweaks in this personnel grouping made for such a, a better potential defensive unit? Yeah, I mean, I think it's really putting all those pieces together. I think in the past, whether it's last early last year, a lot of years in the past, if if a team is moving the ball a few a few times, UNC was going to be out of position and all you know chasing chasing players down, and it was going to result in a wide open wide open shot. I think you're seeing that a lot less right now, but you know it, it goes back to part of it, and I wouldn't say Leaky has had a a true lockdown game. Not that he's needed it, even though Noah Friedel from JMU shot, you know, <laughs> couldn't, oh, 12. <laughs> yeah, o, o of 12 and, and didn't even, you know, was always looking for leaky over his back shoulder. But I think you have, you have that as, as kind of your, your, your center point. And then to, last year, we talked about the lack of shot blocking. Armando proved to be, uh, I'd say decent um, when in position, uh, just given his size, but, I think now that you have two guys, um, the concern Cheryl was talking about being impressed, you know, more impressed with Pete Nance's lateral ability, which I have as well. I think that's still going to be a question mark when teams look to attack him better at with better athletes from the perimeter. But they've they the, the bigs have been able to stay, even when they get switched and pick and rolls, they've been able to stay and contain the guard. So they're they're right there for, you know, pretty good shot shot block attempts. Um and then, you know, Caleb has been putting in I think a more focused effort defensively, getting through ball screens, um, recovering, putting pressure. RJ has as well. I think the one weakness, you know, in Charleston was they're getting the guards are getting posted up. Um, so there wasn't really those help opportunities and they're taking advantage of RJ's size at times. But for the most part, they've been been playing together, putting putting pressure on. And I would love to talk about this in a little bit offensively, uh, the statistic, but in terms of assists to field goals made. UNC defensively is ranked seventh in the country right now, uh, which shows that there's not a lot of easy shots or making opponents work and they're not letting guys just blow by them um, and get easy opportunities. So they are working as a, as a team from a defensive perspective. And I think that that's shown so far, um, but I think still room, room to grow. So one of the people that we called out there uh, during that rundown was Caleb Love. And I think most Tar Heel fans had all sorts of expectations for Caleb Love coming into the season, and rightfully so. He's shown flashes of being an elite player. Uh, he absolutely just blew everybody's mind during the run to the Final Four last year. Um, but Caleb Love seems to be a guy that has not only taken to heart the weaknesses in his game that have been circled you know, amongst talking heads like us and, and in the press and, and whatever, but more importantly, it looks as if he's taken the the coaching for the gaps in his game that will take him to the next level and to hopefully be an NBA player. Sean, I've seen a couple of things differently. I think Inside Carolina subscribers and Tar Heel fans have seen things differently. What's been the biggest difference in Caleb Love's game that you've seen so far this year? Big, well, I mean, the biggest difference offensively is his ability to get get to the basket. I think that that's something we've <laughs> – we've honed it, you know, t touched on for, for two years. And even in, in the first game, it looked like he was more, more explosive, stronger. Um, and I think that's shown from his ability to turn the corner or even uh, with his blow by speed of getting, getting to the basket and finishing, you know, that was something year one could, couldn't really turn the corner on people uh, would, you know, if he did get in the paint would, would jump off that left foot and, and when, wouldn't really explode and, and fade away and shot an extremely low percentage. Last year was better, but but still was was struggling. And then, you know, we had that UCLA game in the tournament where all of a sudden he's just turning the corner and getting to the rim. 
um, finishing a lot better. And that's been the one thing from an improvement standpoint that has jumped out in terms of the whole team is just hit the, the it looks like the the strength and explosiveness that he did did add over the summer. And um, right now it's almost a reversal of how efficient he's been at the rim um, compared to last year, as well as, you know, from a three point. So it's almost been flip flop, but I'd say that's been, you know, from offensive perspective, the biggest adjustment and defensively, I mean, he's, he's exerting, exerting effort. Um, there's not really possessions. You're saying, well, you know, he, he gave that one up or he, he wasn't involved. He's, you know, as we just talked about, he's fighting through ball screens and he's using that length to, to pressure the ball handler. Cheryl, I want to come to you as well. You've, You've seen Caleb Love for a long time. Um, we've been critical of him here on this podcast. Uh, I think Inside Carolina subscribers have have both loved and hated him at times. But what I've seen so far this year has been a more complete player. What are some ways that you feel like he's become more complete? Uh, you know, Sean mentioned some of the defensive things, uh, and he also talked about his ability to get to the rim. I'm seeing a guy that's looking to pass the ball. I'm seeing a guy that's you know, that's, that's hitting twos at a higher frequency. What are some things that you've seen that you feel like you're making him a better player? I definitely think the willingness to pass, not that it wasn't there before, but it, he's made a concerted effort uh, to be a distributor. Now he's right at where he's usually is in his career for assists per game through four games. He's at 3.3. He's been at 3.6 basically his entire career. However, his turnovers are down um, a good amount. You know, again, that first year, um, it was a lot <laughs> as far as turnovers. I think he was up towards like three and a half. And this year he's at two, which is the lowest in his career thus far. So you're seeing someone who, um, even though it doesn't feel like it all the time, is taking c- better care of the ball. Uh, someone who is uh, trying to to make the extra pass, I think, most of the time. Um, there's still some of that Caleb BM Caleb that's just going to be there because that's who he is. And that's one of the reasons that he, he was so good down the stretch last year is because he wants to take – the big shots he wants to hit the shot that ends the game um you know even if Carolina's up six he thinks you know hitting a three and putting him up nine is, is going to end the game um so there's that part that you that you love about him uh and then I think defensively as Sean said when he's really chosen to he's frustrated opponents because he is you know he's a he's a good athlete and he's got good size for a two guard in college um there aren't going to be that many guys much bigger than him at the two guard in, in college so I think that those are a couple of ways. And then my main thing with him, though, I think is um, you just you want some balance. Uh, it seems like, you know, after his freshman year, he said, OK, I'm going to make an effort to cut down on turnovers and I've got to get my three point percentage up. I've got to do it. And so he did. And he, he dropped his turnovers by about half of a turnover per game. And of course, his three point percentage went up by like 20 points or, or something ridiculous. And so it was like, OK, done. Sophomore season. Going into junior season, well, I've got to be more efficient at the rim. I've got to try to distribute more. Um, so that's going to be my my focus. And while he's done that, because he's, I think it's up to 60% from two or something like that. And we just talked about the assist to turnover numbers, but his three-point percentage is dipped. So you just want to kind of see him be balanced, uh, not one thing kind of out of whack and the other, both things kind of on the fringes on either side. You want to see him come back to the middle on both things a little bit, because I don't think we believe he's going to shoot 60% from two the rest of the season, just like we don't think he's going to shoot 19% from three. So you want to kind of have those numbers meet a little bit. Um, that's what I'm looking for, I think, in Portland um, over the next few days for him. It's just a little more balance from that 60%, 19% kind of range. You're reading my mind, man. The next question I was going to ask is, is do we think the, that his shooting is going to come around? And if anything that I've learned from you and Sean on the show is that, you know, Shooters can have game aberrations, but if they're a shooter, at some point those numbers are going to come back to where they are. Um, one of the things I want to talk about, looking back on these these first four games, I think Tar Heel fans have a little bit of consternation around the fact that the Heels haven't blown anybody out. Right? They've had instances, you know, like you guys mentioned, where there have been halves of halves or halves of games where they've looked really good. And there have been times when they've looked really good defensively and times they've looked elite offensively, but they've yet to kind of string that together. Do we feel like that is uh, just a team feeling each other out, learning its identity and kind of getting back into game shape? Or do we feel like they're playing to the level of their competition? Sean, I'll go to you first. I, I don't know if I would go with, with 
e- either one. I mean, I think to, to me, um, you know, and, and it, it really comes <laughs> the fair word ball movement and are they playing together? Are they playing for each other? And it, uh, JMU in the first half, I think that was the first time it was like, Hey, these guys are playing for each other. They're looking to get the best shot on different possessions, um, moving the ball, the first uh, three that Caleb shot, you know, he hadn't taken taken a shot in the first few minutes, and all of a sudden, uh, a set play and found himself wide open at the top of the top of the key for catch and shoot three, which he hit. Um, and you're up 19, 19 at the half or seventeen, whatever whatever it was. And then the second half went back into you know kind of how they've been been playing uh, this year, and it seems I don't want to say selfish, but it hasn't been looking for the teammate, um, you know, just looking at the Char- college of Charleston game and the Gardner Webb, I think there was around 11 transition possessions and not expecting this team to be Bellarmine where you're, you know, nobody's dribbling the ball and you're just passing it around, but went through those 11 possessions and there was 65 dribbles and three passes. And that's See, not transition. Now you're just speaking to my heart about, you know, calling out uh, Bellarmine and, and how beautiful their offense is, but please continue, sir. <laughs> Um, but you know, I, I think that to me, that was, I know there's a lot more transition against JMU, but that was a crazy number. And it just showed like RJ was getting the ball or Caleb was getting the ball or a few times Lee, was getting the ball. They're just dribbling up. Like this is transition. You need to be looking for your teammates. And I think that showed throughout a lot of the halves. And to me, that's going to be the biggest thing when they're in Portland is, are they willing to move the ball? Like they did so, so well towards the end of the season. Or are they going to be content to to over dribble and take contested contested threes and half the team is just standing standing around? So, you know, we talked about assist to field goals made defensively. Um, offensively, they ranked three hundred forty one three hundred forty one in the country. So that just shows, um, you know, that seven over under seventeen assists that we that we had a few weeks ago. Uh, I think Sherelle told me I had the under, uh, which I couldn't couldn't remember. But you can pretty much cash that one in four games, <laughs> four games in, because you know that's so far off from uh, where where they need to be. Um, so long winded answer, but I think they're in game shape. Obviously, it's you know they're filling in Pete Nance and working in Puff, working in some of the young guys off the bench. So there, there's that. But to me, it's the larger issue of. Or are they playing for each other? And I think we saw that the first half against JMU, but we haven't seen that the majority of the season so far. Look, man, when you've got me as the host, we're okay with long-winded answers. Because if, if we've learned anything, it's that I'm a bit verbose at times. Sherelle, I want to ask you the same thing. Is this team playing down to their competition, or are they just figuring some things out? I think it's a little bit of both, too. Uh, not to be diplomatic, but... Um... That's that seems to be what it is to me, and I know I've said this over and over, and I don't mean to belabor the point, but it's just not it, as much as the coaches want everybody to treat everything the same, as much as the fans want everybody to treat the, every opponent the same. That's just not reality. Like you just, it's more difficult to get up for these early season games than it is to play in the final four against Duke, and these guys have been talking about that run, you know, experiencing that run, living in that run for a few months. And it's going to take some time for that to finally go away. I think we're getting close. You saw that the first team that really, really, really got their attention, that everybody was like, hmm, this could be a loss. You saw what happened. They were up yeah. 19 at halftime. Yeah. Um. So I think that's part of it. It's just human nature, Um. I think, is part of it. But then also, um, working in Pete Nance, is, he's not Brady Manic, like Sean said, and like everybody – Anybody who knows Carolina basketball has been saying for several months they're not the same player. So there's that. And then you do have to reestablish a rhythm. Like you just can't go back onto the court and yeah. it be the second half against Duke. That's not the way it works. Um, you have to develop this stuff within the season, regardless of how much you play together over the course of, you know, two, three, four years. And that's why the uh, the assist numbers, they are, as Hebrew would say, they are yellow flag. They're concerning. But uh, I don't think you can press the panic button just yet. Um, but tennis is a game is not great, especially for a team like this, this that is experienced and 
um, that has a lot of good offensive parts. That there there needs to be a lot more than that. I think it's forty assists uh, and one hundred and seven made field goals or or something like that. Um, not good. That's not. You know, Hebrew Davis talks about Carolina basketball. That's not Carolina basketball at all. Um, that's a lot of dribbling, a lot of pounding, a lot of standing around and watching. So I think the sooner that they can start um, playing these better teams and start moving and start uh, passing the ball, get integrated, I think you'll see the offense be better. Um, but right now they have to lean on the defense to win until the offense can come around. And that's even considering to rip off Roy Williams and Dean Smith. That's that even if you include the assist quote the way we keep them it's still not going to make that number but so much better and, uh, and it sounds absurd to say that the office needs to come around they had a hundred and right two, two points against college Charleston. they had 80 something the other night but it's just not there's just something not clicking right now that i think will click soon yeah and i think we learned watching the virginia tech game the other night i think college of charleston might be legit uh if nothing else they've got some dudes and i don't think it was as much north carolina being terrible Something else I want to call out, too, and, and Cheryl, you alluded to it a little bit. This team, one of the biggest knocks against them last year, as we saw in that you know dreaded Pittsburgh game, they played down to their competition most of the season last year, and they played up to their competition most of the season last year, as we saw in the stretch run. So when you consider that most of this team is the same group of guys from last year, um, it's not really shocking that they would be a team playing somewhat to the level of their competition. What you uh, hope for, what you hope for moving forward, is just more maturity, and you know the ability to handle that. You don't have to play. Right. It's impossible to play your A game thirty-seven times a year. It's just not, it's not feasible. But the hope is that your B game or your B plus game is still good enough most of the time. The issue is when you let your D game come out or your 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 uh, your F game come out. That's when you start to have issues. So just keep it at at you know D plus C minus game at worst, and I think they'll be fine. One of the things they can do to show some maturity is is in their purchases of of UNC memorabilia and gear. Um, not memorabilia so much as gear, but either way, Johnny t shirts going to take care of you. That is a mature purchase. Go to Johnny T-Shirt, johnnytshirt.com. Use the extra 10% off that you get as a premium Inside Carolina subscriber. And hey, if you're listening or watching this show, you're not an Inside Carolina premium subscriber. I don't know what's wrong with you. For those of you watching right now, I'm getting really close to the camera because I want to show you how intent I am on you becoming a premium subscriber. Get that extra 10% off. Go ahead, join up, but then go to Johnny T-Shirt. Y'all, Thanksgiving is this week, which means as soon as the dishes are washed on Thursday, you're going to be flooded with uh, holiday gift lists and Christmas ideas. And the Amazon gift book already came to my kids. Thanks, Mom. Uh, go ahead and put Johnny T-Shirt on the list for every Tar Heel in your life. I promise you, they've got what that person wants. And if they don't have it, that person don't need it. All right, Johnny T-Shirt, big supporters of this show, locally owned, alumni operated. We're fans of theirs. They're so such great supporters of Inside Carolina's content. We're really thankful for them. Season of thanks, we're thankful for Johnny T-Shirt. We want you to be too. Take a quick break. You don't need to hear me talk. We'll let the national guys come in here and run some advertisements for a second. We'll be right back with more on this episode of the Coast to Coast podcast. All right, thanks for sticking around. We appreciate y'all being here. Happy to be talking about real hoops again here on the Inside Carolina Coast to Coast podcast. I'm Joey Powell. With me as always, Sean Moran, Sherelle McMillan. Guys, we talked about you know this team trying to figure things out and maybe um, you know adjusting for level of competition. Well, things are going to change really quickly in the next uh, 48 to 72 hours. They're heading out west to play Portland uh, on Thanksgiving Day at 1 p.m. local time. And then they've got a stretch uh, uh, that's the first of five games on the road that I think will really determine a lot of how people feel about the team, but also will go a long way in, in cementing who they're going to be this year. Uh, just to give you a quick rundown of that, they're playing in the PK-80, so the first game I think is against Villanova or Iowa State. Uh, and then, depending on whether they win or lose, could be playing against Michigan State or who's the other one in the bracket? Alabama. Alabama, attaboy. Yeah, um, just glossing over Portland. I said Portland first, didn't I? Uh, yeah, they, 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 that's the first game on Thanksgiving Day. Come on, man. Nobody's sleeping on the River Dogs or whatever. That, I can't remember what they are. <laughs> um, so after that, they'll have those two games in a span of three days, right? Then they'll, on the way back, uh, stop in Bloomington, Indiana for the Big Ten ACC Challenge. I know Sean's excited to watch a lot of Big Ten basketball. So 
Uh, if you know anything about Assembly Hall in Bloomington, because that's going to be loud. Uh, Indiana fans have no love loss for North Carolina. That's going to be a really good ball game. Indiana has gotten a lot better the last couple of years. And then North Carolina, after a few days, will play at Blacksburg against a Virginia Tech team that returns a lot from last season. And depending on who you believe, is projected to be in the top third or top fourth of, uh, of the conference this year in the ACC. So, guys, how much do we think we're going to learn about this team over the next five games? And, Sherelle, what are, what are some things we need to look for? Uh, yeah, I think you'll learn a ton. I mean, <laughs> did you hear that <laughs> schedule? I mean, you, you've got Portland and then, you know, potentially like an Iowa State or a Villanova and then potentially a Michigan State or Alabama. Michigan State already has one of the best uh, wins of the season. Um, and then – you take a break and then you, and remember that game isn't until Sunday, the third game of the PK 80 is not until Sunday. Late Sunday. Yeah. So then you, you get on a plane and fly to Bloomington and then you have to play any, any team. Like you said, that's going to be, this is their game. This is it. You know, this is the biggest game on their schedule um, this season. And, you know, I, I'll say I was at how did assembly- you disrespect <laughs> Purdue and Minnesota yeah. like that, sir? Right, right. I, I was at the Assembly <laughs> Hall game in 2005. Uh, I had a hookup, mm. and I was at that game. The Sean May, the Sean May homecoming. homecoming. It was technically 2004, but the 2004 or five season, and that place was insane. And that was a bad Indiana team that year. So imagine how they're going to be when they actually have a, a team in the top ten, uh, or top. I think it's number eleven, top ten or eleven. Um, so you you have that, and then. You go to Blacksburg a few days later, which, you know, last year, I think we forget the game after Pittsburgh, I believe, was at Virginia Tech. And that was the game that really no one talks about that saved UNC season because Carolina had it, to win it. Yeah, they had to win it. Um, and that's a tough place to play. And it wasn't an easy win for them either. So, I mean, that is a brutal schedule. Um, so that's first off. I hate to just go over it like you did, but it is All a good. very, very tough schedule. I think what you look for is some of the things we talked about. Caleb Love. That three-point percentage, um, does he get open looks? Does he catch fire? Because we know that once one or two go in, you know, six or seven can go in very quickly. That's one thing you look for. Um, how much does Puff play, I think, um, alongside Pete Nance uh, is, is something to watch for because they're kind of working him in as the backup four, it feels like right now, when Baycott goes to the bench. So um, will he pay, play with Baycott some? Will he play with Nance? How much will he play? Um, and then the other thing is right now they're playing seven guys. Uh, you know, uh, Trimble, Puff, and the starting five pretty much was the rotation now. Obviously, it's only one game for Puff, but do they try to get some more time for Justin McCoy and for Tyler Nickel and DeMarco Dunn um, and Dontre Styles because they have, you know, was it six games basically in a week? Um, do they try to use the bench more or are they going to just ride that top seven uh, like he's been? <laughs> I mean, all the starters are over 31 minutes a game so far this season. Um, so that's that, what I'm hold for. that thought. Hold that thought about the rotation, but please go ahead. Uh, yeah. So those those are a, a few of the things I think. Um, Caleb Love shooting, uh, kind of Puff Johnson's impact, and then what the rotation looks like moving forward with so many games in such a short time. Sean, same thing. What are some things that you want to see from this team? And it could be either end of the floor uh, that will make you kind of have a better idea idea of their identity or, or feel better by getting your arms around who they are right now. Yeah, I mean, you know, you, you look at the upcoming schedule and when you look at the whole thing, it it's um, you know, it's 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 definitely a, a tough one over over two weeks, especially with two true road games, um, at Indiana and at Virginia Tech. And I think Virginia Virginia Tech's probably fourth best team in the ACC. I know they did lose to Charleston, but they've got a lot of talent returning and are very, very well coached. Um so and then you have have Indiana, but in terms of what I would like to see, um, I mean, it's once again, it's just improved offensive play where they're getting easier shots and not, not continuing to force or, you know, I know Caleb had a ton of deep threes. They both, you know, Caleb and RJ hit a ton of deep threes last year, step backs, but I think right now they're not hitting them and there's ways to find easier shots for them to hit or for teammates to hit. Um, I also think, one of the things we talked about a lot this summer was leaky black offensively. We've seen how teams have continued to play the the safety um, for the most part in the paint. And he's, you know, he's hit four threes so far. If he can continue to be respectable, that's going to make teams really struggle, uh, especially when they're trying to guard Armando down low, who hasn't, uh, you know, 
let's say offensive rebound wise hasn't been able to finish like he did last year. He's shooting a little bit lower of a percentage, but pound for pound, this is the best team in the country, or at least the top, top three, three team. Uh, the teams are playing are not top five teams, but they are very, very good teams. Um, so I think it's just, I, I think this will help get their competitive spirit up having that, having that competition. Uh, but at the same time, want to see the ball movement and want to want to just see the team having fun uh, playing together. Well, one more thing I add to Joey is, sure. you know, I, last year I talked about resisting temptation. Mm-hmm. I think I want to see the guards do that because last year Armando did a great job of like all the talk was about how he was going to take threes and he was going to operate on the perimeter, but he realized what he was and what he was best at mm-hmm. and he did it. And I think the guards need to realize that what the team is best at or the team can be its its best self when Armando, Armando is the, you know, the focus of the offense. So um, just, I, I'd like to see them not forget him because if that happened, I think the, the, the beginning of the second half when JMU kind of cut into UNC's lead. Yeah. I think there was maybe seven or eight straight possessions where Armando didn't get a touch. And that just can't happen because he's too dominant, too good, too um too involved in what UNC wants to do for him not to get touches on seven or eight straight possessions. Well, it's not as if James Madison was running three seven footers around him either to prevent mm-hmm. the entry passes, right? It's it's just like you said, it's it's them taking uh taking what JMU wanted them to have as opposed to what they wanted. Um, I want to kind of stay there as, as we're getting close to wrapping the show up. Um, we've talked a little bit about uh, your know, rotations. And, and one of the things I've picked up on really quickly is even with Puff Johnson being out until this past week and Jalen Washington still uh, getting back to health, we've learned really quickly that Hubert Davis has already identified who is in his circle of trust for this part of the season thus far. It's really clear who is and who is not. Um, Sean, I want to go to you first. Do the folks that are in that circle or out of that circle surprise you at all? And if so, who is it? And why? No, I don't think anybody. I think the one, the surprising thing is that it it has gotten to the seven so quickly. Although I guess we shouldn't be surprised after after last season. But you know, Puff. I, I mean, I think he he was playing fantastic uh, last year at the end of the season. And when you look at the freshmen. Seth Trimble was the the highest rated one, and I think everybody knew he was the one that was most ready to contribute, especially defensively, even if he wasn't a strong strong shooter. Uh, I think it would still be nice if they could expand it to to eight. Uh, you know, from a guard perspective, Marco Dunn hit a th- you know came out you know hit a three that that was nice to see. Um, Tyler Nickel and you know he had a three early on. He, he got a little playing time in the first half, so it does seem like. Hebert's willing to play a little bit more in the first half, but if you're not, if you don't perform or you make a mistake, you're out. And I think that's what we saw with, with styles who a lot of people had high hopes for coming into the season. And he had some lapses the first, first game, first half. And, uh, you know, he's kind of been in the doghouse since. Um, So not surprised on who is in the circle of trust. I think more from a long-term perspective, you look at that seven and you have what three, three of the seven that will be around next year. Um, so when you are looking at the long term, I, I think there definitely needs to be uh, some more playing time allotted to the guys, but it's not, you know, it might be the Portland game. It's not going to be the next two games after that, or even IU or um, Virginia tech outside of maybe some spot minutes or somebody playing well, but you do have some time in December. So all that being said, you know, looking forward, last thing I'll say on that is both Seth Trimble and Puff Johnson. I mean, Puff coming back, Seth being a freshman, they're still going to continue to get better. And if they get better, then, you know, then you have a really strong, strong seven. But ideally, if you could have a, you know, say eight, eight right now, and then you whittle that down over time instead of playing everybody 30 plus minutes right off the bat. Shirelli, are you shocked that the numbers kind of been as narrow as, or the, that the circle of trust has been as as narrow as it has been thus far? No, I, I thought it would be eight. Uh, um, so I guess one less than I thought. Because uh, Dontre Styles, I think we all kind of assumed that yeah. he would take the next step, you know, freshman to sophomore, after some of the things he did in the tournament. And 
um, be able to really help out specifically on, on the defensive end. And that just hasn't happened yet. Uh, I'll ask you all this. How many minutes has Dontrell style played in the second half this season? It's a big fat zero. zero there, Big Daddy. Zero. And I think that, to me, that, that says everything. Um, that the, the coach just isn't quite there yet um, and, and trusting him to do what the coach wants him to do. Uh, and Puff, you know, first game back, 13 minutes. Uh, so, you know, the seven the, the seven players who, who it is, again, it's not surprising. Um, I do wonder what Jalen Washington will, will look like long for competitive basketball for so long. Mm -hmm. But I do think from a talent perspective and what this team – really needs i think his skill set is would be very welcome right now that that trail big who can shoot from the perimeter and mm -hmm. who has a long wingspan who can block shots um it's just that you know you can't expect much from him after not playing for a year and a half um and jumping into you know acc play but i do think what he provides is kind of i think what you would need or, or potentially want is that eighth guard or eighth person uh because if, if we're being on what we talked about this there's just there's not enough minutes to go around for yeah. everyone on the team because rj davis and caleb love are going to play 30 minutes a game that's just the way it's going to be so there's not a ton of time for the other guards um so i think it's like where can you get something that's lacking on the team if the other guards who maybe have strengths like shooting aren't going to play as much because of rj and caleb and I, that's where i see Jalen potentially helping out. That's where Tyler Nickel in, in spots, I think, can help out because they do need a little more shooting. Um, and it doesn't have to come from the guards. It can come from anyone on the floor. So, um, yeah, I, I rambled a little bit, but I, I think the, the seven is a good seven. You, you would hope that he, he get to eight, and I think eight's a really good rotation. Sherelle, should I be shocked that that seven are all – fairly defensive minded players or they're they're guys that have shown that they have a propensity to play really good defense at times if not all the time not at all uh, i think <laughs> hubert davis made it abundantly clear last year with the way he went about uh organizing playing time that defense was going to be uh paramount it was going to be the thing that really kept you on the court there were other players who did other things much better than uh their defense and they didn't get on the court at all. And they're no longer here. Um, so it, it was pretty clear from the moment he took over. I think um, the moment we saw him in games take over that he wanted strong defensive players. So um, Johnson and Trimble are probably the two best player defensive players who aren't in the starting five. So I, it makes a ton of sense. And some of the things lineup wise that you're going to be able to do with those seven, like you, you talk about a lineup with like, Seth, you know, say you wanted to say you were up 15 or 16 and you really wanted to kind of choke the lead and not let the other team do anything. Roll out, you know, something like Caleb, Leakey, Uff, Armando, and Nance. You know, that's 6'3", 6'8", 6'8", 6'10", 6'10", all can move our athletics. So there's a lot of options, I think, especially defensively that Hebrew Davis has at his, his disposal with that seven. I think just one one thing to, to add, um, you know, you think back to the uh, Baylor game and UCLA game where Style, Styles was better suited in a Marquette Baylor type of type of game where mm -hmm. you're going against better athletes and, and stronger players, and then Puff, UCLA going going forward where more more skill. Um, and I do think I, I've been impressed with Tyler Nickel in the minutes that he has gotten. I know he's only hit one three, and defensively is the concern. So that goes against what we're saying which we don't probably why we only saw him two minutes against jmu but from an offensive perspective have liked you know he's not afraid to shoot it he's playing playing hard he moves the ball well and he, he makes quick decisions which i think is is really important in terms of if he gets the ball he's looking to attack or put pressure mm -hmm. or it's going up or he's passing so i do think i'll be interested to see how his case plays out uh because once you get into the acc but more importantly the tournament based on styles of play or even, I mean, thinking UVA, um, you know, come ACC where maybe nickel gets in and they're going to give up more three point shots. So, you know, he comes in and stretches the defense for instance. So I think he could be used depending on, on, on situation. So we'll be interested to see how he continues to, to fare as well as the playing time he gets. That's a good point. We learned last year that Hubert Davis was 
was much more inclined to use an NBA style, not only of, of offensive uh, sets and, and sort of game plan, but maybe to your point, the deployment of players is going to mirror that much more of the NBA than, than it has in years past where he does use a situational player like Dontre Styles or, or a guy like Tyler Nichol just to come in and, and you know, break down a, th- a team that's, that's not very strong on the perimeter. Um, all right, guys, last question. We'll get out of here. I know you guys have the, have the Turkey, a, a, a basting and Sean, please tell me you're not a canned cranberry sauce guy. <laughs> Okay. All right. If you were, I was going to actually just end this show and, and never invite you back on. Thank you for making me feel better about, about what people out there on the left coast are doing with their cranberries nowadays. Last question before we get out of here. Um, let's analyze. And we talked about the road trip that's coming up. I want you guys to tell me what you need to see on this road trip that will, you know, in your mind, be a good result for the Tar Heels. Sean, go first. Five and oh. Five and zero. Oh? No, is there anything less no, than five I, and zero? Oh? Sean's I mean, not happy. All right. No. no well, you, you, probably because uh, all these teams are are beatable uh, or should sure. be beatable. I mean, but I don't. If you look at Ken Palm and say Alabama makes it the championship, they're probably favored in two games and underdogs and you know slight underdogs in three. Um, so I would say four four and one being realistic, but um, three and two I wouldn't. I wouldn't be thrilled, you know, next time we're on, they went, they go three and two, unless it was, you know, I could see if they make it to the championship game and play Alabama, uh, you know, that could be a really entertaining game, especially some of those matchups and how well Alabama has been playing. Um, so, I mean, yeah. if you lose kind of like, uh, what was it? The, the Vegas, Kentucky, UNC game uh, when they, when they won, it was the back and forth. Like you can't complain about, about that one. Uh, but if it's an ugly, ugly game where they just get blown out or go to Bloomington and get stomped by an average big 10 team, I won't be, I won't be thrilled. Um, so Sean, is there anything in the big 10 that's not average? I mean, let's be honest here. I, I, I know Ohio you. state football. That's the only thing. <laughs> Talking about basketball here, bro. You're on the wrong <laughs> podcast. If you want to talk about football? Um, uh, I, I, I go to football. I love, I love the fact that you never hesitate a chance to get some big 10 basketball shade in there. I love you for it. Sherelle, same thing, man. Before we get out of here, what do you want to see, or what do you what do you need to see to consider this a good road trip for the Tar Heels? Yeah, I think at minimum three wins, um, and then I think at least one complete game. Uh, it doesn't. You prefer it not be against Portland. You prefer it would be against <laughs> uh, Villanova, potentially Iowa State or Michigan State, Indiana or Virginia Tech. You'd prefer it be against one of those, um, but just one complete game where. From start to finish, you know, the defense is crisp, the offense, the ball's moving, um, and they they look like the number one team in the country. They look like the most experienced, you know, starting five in Carolina history. They look like a team that has the, you know, preseason ACC player of the year, that has another first team preseason, that has potential All-Americans, that has all this talent. They just need to look like that, you know, at least once. Twice would be great, um, but at least once. And I, I would, I'd feel confident that, it was more of, you know, building into something versus some kind of systemic issue. Um, and then it's funny, Sean, you know, Carolina's kind of entering the, the Big Ten portion of the schedule. You know, over the next month, they could have Michigan State, Indiana, and then they also have, they definitely have Ohio State and Michigan. So, you know, arguably could be the top four in the Big Ten here it's over the, the next month. It's the summer of Sean, man. <laughs> you know, and, and they haven't, dominated the big 10 lately like they they used to at the beginning of the roy williams era so but you know michigan state i think that could be could be i mean if they make it past villanova or iowa state i think that whatever game that will be will be a really a really good one um ohio state is not you know th- that should be a win and then at bloomington will be tough so you know, it'll it'll probably it'll hurt if they do lose to one or two or even three Big Ten teams, but um, hopefully they can uh, power through, power the, through it. The other thing I like too about the schedule is is uh, the potential for different styles. Yeah, you look at you know how Villanova plays versus how Virginia Tech plays versus how Indiana plays versus how Michigan State plays. All different. There's there are obviously similarities, but you've got some very uh, NBA uh, yeah. styled offensive and defenses. Then you have some very, you know, old school kind of motion flex 
offenses and then you have kind of new age where everybody's you know it's five out like virginia tech yeah so there's a lot of styles that are going to be playing over the next you know week and a half and uh i'll be curious to see how they respond to that so that, that's a big challenge too how, how they respond to all those different styles yeah i mean just looking at the potential the potential finals you know whoever they play on the last i don't want to say the finals the last day of the pk80 whether it's uh michigan state or, or alabama those two teams are polar opposite of each other right like just yeah. not not the same at all and I, and I think, you know, last year up until the Duke game, it was, well, where are the, where are the good wins? And we already know in the ACC, it's going to be Duke, UVA, Virginia Tech, and there, there's probably not much after that. Um, so if they can stack some of these wins now, you know, that, that helps solidify seed discussions come, come March. And to, to the Big Ten's credit, you know, we saw last year they kind of beat each other up and they all were giving each other the quad one wins and given <laughs> there could be three or four games there that that's just, you know, the stuff that UNC needs to build now, which they're not going to get for the most part in ACC play. Well, guys, I do want to sad to say, <laughs> I do want to issue one me a call before I get out of here. I did not mean to besmirch the good name of the Portland pilots, Portland pilots. <laughs> Not the River Dogs, who are, as everyone knows, a okay. minor league baseball team. Um, guys, I appreciate it. Always love having you. Love doing these podcasts. Hope everybody loves being a part of them uh, and, and involving themselves, whether it's listening or, or downloading or watching on YouTube, whatever you whatever you do. We appreciate you being a part of this little family that we got here. Um, guys, I'm excited. Thank you so much for your time. Oh, you got two pennies, Shrill? You about to, th about to throw some copper at me? Yeah, yeah, we got we, we got time for two pennies. Man, I always got time for your two pennies, man. To to Sean's point about stacking wins, you know, I this is a thing I've always talked about, but the NCAA first and second round is in Greensboro this year. And there's a team down the road that they usually compete with for that spot. Um, I don't think they'll because of things that have happened in the past, and I don't think both of them will be there. Um, so that's something to think about that you're competing for essentially two home games in the NCAA tournaments. So that's a big deal. And then to uh, Drake Powell, UNC's lone 2024 commit, started his season this past weekend and opened with 27 points and a win. So uh, a good first showing from him. Sean, what about you, man? Do you have two pennies that you'd like to throw into the fountain before we get out of here? No, I think uh, Shrell, Shrell covered it. But in terms of other things I'd like to see, hopefully the three-point shooting goes, goes up and looking forward to watching – uh, leaky defensively, uh, you know, against some of these these top teams. But and actually, I guess last thing is, is in terms of Armando, there could be some good big man matchups uh, that we get yeah. to get to watch, and um, you know, just see how how one of the, the best players in the country is competing, you know, against some other top bigs that will whether it's a little taller or longer or different, you know, different versatility. So looking forward to seeing that, fellas. Thank you so much. Thank you for the final four cents of the show. I wouldn't want to get out of here on $9.96. So thank y'all for rounding it up, making it work. Guys, have a great Thanksgiving to all of our listeners and viewers. We appreciate you being here. We're thankful for you. Um, have a great Thanksgiving with your families. And we will be back very soon. Again, as soon as, uh, as soon as we get to the ACC championship portion of the football season, we'll be back doing these weekly. So guys, thanks so much. Appreciate you being a being a part of this show appreciate what you bring to the show because y'all make it honestly nobody's here to hear me uh, and thanks to our listeners remember rate review subscribe all that good stuff special shout out to johnny t-shirt for sponsoring thanks to john siegley for producing but for sean moran and for Cheryl mcmillan i'm joey powell this has been inside carolina's coast to coast podcast we will see you soon late